O firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said, you who unto Jesus for refuge have fled? Fear not, I am with thee, O oh, be not dismayed. I, I am thy God, and will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand upheld by my gracious omnipotent hand. I see the work of your hands, galaxies spin in a heavenly dance, O oh God, all that you are is so overwhelming. I hear the sound of your voice, all at once it's a gentle and thundering noise, O oh God, all that you are is so overwhelming. I delight myself in you, captivated by your beauty. I'm overwhelmed, I'm overwhelmed by you. I'm overwhelmed, I'm overwhelmed by you. I know the power of your cross, forgive and free, forever you'll be my God. All that you've done is so overwhelming, I delight myself in you. I'm overwhelmed, I'm overwhelmed by you. God, I run into your arms, unashamed because of mercy. I'm overwhelmed, I'm overwhelmed by you. I delight myself in you. In the glory of your presence, I'm overwhelmed, I'm overwhelmed by you. God, I run into your arms, unashamed because of mercy, I'm overwhelmed, I'm overwhelmed. Welcome to Twiggenham. Thanks for coming out to be with us this morning. I hope you are doing well, and I hope that you and I can both be overwhelmed today by the glory of the Lord. Am I on? Not very much. Not very much. I'll talk louder. If you're guests, thanks for coming. There's a card on this seat in front of you. You can fill that out and uh, put it in the collection plate when it passes later in our service, which is really, this is all a great way to start because we're going to talk about what happens when you make big mistakes today, all right? So I've made a couple of mistakes already, so you're okay. You don't have to be perfect here. Have you ever had one of those moments where you were in, caught in the middle of a storm? I know in this area, storms are like a big deal because we've seen some big ones. I've had moments before when I was just caught in a huge downpour, lightning coming down all around me. I was standing in the back of a dump truck one day loading stuff, throwing stuff off of it under a transformer. And a lightning bolt hit that transformer and sounded like a howitzer going off in my ear. And I remember the guy, and I, the guy that I was working with, both of us hit the ground and ran as hard as we could to get to shelter because of the storm, because of the lightning, because of the fear, because of the danger. 
You know, that's not just a weather phenomenon, that's a life phenomenon, because some of us probably this morning are in the middle of a storm, and wouldn't it be great if we could find a refuge, a place where we were safe and out of the rain and out of the storm and out of the wind and out of danger. We're going to talk about that this morning. In fact, why don't we do this? Let's stand together and let's just pray right now. Go ahead and stand. Let's pray and ask God to bless us with a place of refuge and safety. Holy Father, we come this morning from a lot of different places in our lives. Some of us are living and walking in the sunshine. And some of us are struggling in the rain, in the thunder, in the lightning, in the storm, in the wind, winds of life. And we come this morning looking for refuge, looking for Jesus. We pray that to, we can find that refuge in this place, among these people, in him. Bless us with your presence. Cover us with your wings. Precious Savior, be our refuge. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry. Everything to God in prayer. Often forfeit, oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise, forsake thee? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms, still take and shield thee. Thou
remain standing as we share from Jude this morning. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others, show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Let us be faithful, 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 Lord. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. Though we cannot see, we still believe. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. We believe in a God who is able to bring justice and mercy to all. And he promises strength for the journey to the steadfast to answer the call. Let us be faithful, 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 Lord. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. And though we cannot see, we still believe. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. We believe in truth of the Bible, in its power and purpose today. There is meaning and life in its pages, we believe and we choose to obey. Let us be faithful, faithful, faithful Lord, let us be faithful, faithful Lord. Though we cannot see, we still believe, let us be faithful, faithful Lord. We believe that he's calling his people to embody his story of grace. Bringing rescue and hope to the broken, may our lives be an offering of grace. Let us be faithful, faithful, faithful Lord. Let us be faithful, faithful Lord. Though we cannot see, we still believe. Let us be faithful, faithful Lord. Let us be faithful. Let us be faithful. And though we cannot see, we still believe, let us be faithful, faithful Lord. Let us be faithful, let us be faithful. And though we cannot see, we still believe, let us be faithful, faithful Lord. Let us be faithful, faithful the table of mercy, prepared with the wine and the bread. All who are hungry and thirsty, come and your souls will be fed. Come to the table of mercy, prepared with the wine. souls will be fed. Come at the Lord's invitation, receive from his nail-scarred hand. Eat of the bread of salvation, drink of the
souls will be fed. Why don't you come at the Lord's invitation? Receive from his nail-scarred hand. Eat of the bread of salvation. Drink of the blood of the Lamb. Joshua chapters 13 through 21 can be some pretty tough reading. It is chapter after chapter of geographic refer references and names of cities. But what is mind-numbingly boring for us was exhilarating for the people of Israel. 400 years in slavery, almost 120 years before that when we get to Genesis 12 and God promises Abraham a land and a place. And here in these chapters, it becomes real. They receive their inheritance. It is palpable. They can touch it. They can see it. They know its boundary lines. And something fascinating happens in, in Joshua 20. The Levites did not get a separate inheritance of land. They received cities within the land. The priests were distributed among the people. But before the priests receive their land, God gives them cities of refuge. These are places where you could flee if you'd killed someone in, unintentionally. Where you could go to find refuge so that so that the next of kin could not take wrath and vengeance upon you and take your life. But there was a catch. You were only safe so long as you stayed within the confines of the city gates. Outside the city lay only danger and death. As we come to the table this morning, the thing I want you to know is the place where you are in the greatest danger is the intersection between God's holiness and your sin. Romans 5, apart from Christ, rightly describes us as enemies of God and subject to his terrible wrath. But tucked safely within his arms, we find not only refuge, but reconciliation. Let's pray for the bread. Father, at times the reality of our sin and wickedness, the things we do that we don't even understand, overwhelms us. And we are confronted with how desperately short we fall of who you've called us to be. We recognize, God, that we can't even live up to the standards we expect others to, to treat us by. And we come to this table, Lord, feeling the weight of that, the reality of it, the soul-deadening crush of it, and somehow lift it up because your son was lifted up to take it all the way, to bear the weight that I cannot bear, to pay the sin that he had no part of, and yet that he paid, that I might have life. And it is for that grace and that glory and that majesty, Father, that we, we praise your name as we partake this bread. In Christ's name, amen.
Dear refuge of my weary soul, on thee when sorrows rise, on thee when waves of trouble roll, my fainting hope relies to thee I tell. I said earlier that you were safe as long as you stayed within the gates of the city. That's true, but it's only partially true. You see, when the high priest died, you were free to go home. And the reason the gospel is the best news in the universe is that we have a high priest who has died. And because he has died, we are free to go home. We're free to go home to live a life that is unshackled from the weight of sin. We are free to go home to live in the fullness of all he has given us. And ultimately, we are free to go home to that eternal city to live with the God of heaven forevermore. Where Psalm 16 says, we shall know fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. Let's pray. Father, how sweet is the word pardon, and how sweet is the word home. And because of what you did in the person of your son over 2,000 years ago in a little hill outside of Jerusalem, we know that sweetness. We know pardon from the stupid, careless sins we have committed that has caused pain in the lives of others, and we know pardon from the willful, premeditated sins that come from places in our heart that we don't even understand. And we know the promise of home. We know the promise of lives lived with the weight of generational sin broken, with the weight of old habits broken. We know the freedom that is to found, be found only in Christ, and we know the promised home for we will see your face. And for that, God, we thank you for his blood. In Christ's name, amen. Hast thou not bid me seek thy face, and shall I seek in vain, and can the ear of sovereign grace be deaf when I complain? No. Sovereign grace of 
to make an offering this morning, may we truly consider all the havens of rest and refuge and retreat that you have already provided for us. And may we also consider the ultimate retreat one day when we all get to heaven. Bless us as we take this offering. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take our offering. One day you'll make everything new, Jesus. One day you will bind every wound. The former things shall all pass away, no more tears. One day you'll make sense of it all, Jesus. One day every question resolved. Rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus, we'll see and shout the victory. One day we will see face to face Jesus. Is there a greater vision of grace? And in a moment. Shall be changed on that day, and one day we'll be free, free indeed. Jesus, one day all the struggle will cease, and we will see your glory revealed on that day when we all. Rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus, we'll see and shout the victory. One day we will see face to face Jesus. Is there a greater vision of grace? And in a moment we shall be changed. Yes, in a moment we shall be changed. In a moment we shall be changed on that day when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be. That is a really cool song. I like that. It's partly new and partly old, like a lot of you. So anyway, 
So here's a fun thing to think about. Uh, we're going to be in Joshua chapter 20 this morning. And I know that a lot of people are disappointed that we didn't sing a Tom Petty song this morning because of the sermon title. And then others of you can Google that and get it later. So, wow, that went, no, that went nowhere. Did it? <laughs> Stop dragging my heart around, people. All right? So, bam. All right. Here's a fun thing to think about. That time you made a really big mistake, and a lot of people knew about it. Remember that time? Maybe, maybe you blew it in front of a, a big crowd, and it cost your team the wind, or it cost your company a contract, or it cost your family an expense they couldn't afford. You're probably going to thank me after church for reminding you of that time you made a really big mistake. In the grand scheme of things, though, really, our, our fails are not nearly as big as we imagined. Because my, my, my philosophy has been for a long time now, anything that can be fixed with a little bit of money and a little bit of time is not a life-altering fail. It's more like a blooper. Like this weekend. First really pretty weekend we've had, I'm cleaning up my truck. I like to have a clean truck. I like to have a clean vehicle. Wash it. Do the wheels, the tires. If you don't do your wheels and tires, you haven't finished cleaning your vehicle. Get ready to do the windshield. The windshield's the last thing I'm going to do, right? So I grab the spray bottle and I give it, I just really spray a generous amount on the windshield. And then I realize that doesn't smell like window cleaner. That smells a lot like tire shine. I thoroughly coated my windshield with tire shine. Do you know how hard it is to get tire shine, Meguiar's shiny tire shine off your windshield. It is so hard. You notice Lisa isn't sitting with me this morning. She is home working on my windshield as we speak. <laughs> Actually, she's in the nursery. But these day, today, I've got a truck. I've got streak-free tires and really shiny windshield. So that's not a big mistake. A little irritating, but not a big mistake. It's not as big as the mistake I made back in the 80s when I did a wedding for this young couple. You guys, I know all of you will remember, and you may have seen this in a museum somewhere, the little cassette tapes we used to use to record things with. Remember those? About the size of a phone these days. Had two little holes in it and tape that ran between the holes. When the tape got tangled, what did you use the pencil eraser for, right? Turn it in there to fix the tape. So I, I'm, it was a small wedding. So I agree, I agreed to, to make, the, make the music, to put the music on tape for the bride and the groom. It was going to be in a house, very small wedding. And so I, I made the music. I had the tape deck set up. I had the big boom box set up, top of the stairs. The Braves were in the playoffs. So I popped another tape in to record the, the playoffs while I was doing the wedding, except I did use the wrong tape, and I taped over the wedding music. This was before Spotify, when you could go download Canon and D like that. So we were, and, this, and that happened five minutes before the wedding. Five minutes before the wedding, and we've got Chip Carey telling us about Braves baseball. <laughs> Not working, right? But it was okay, it was a Church of Christ crowd, so we sang a common love for them to come into, and blessed be the tie that binds for them to leave. And it worked out perfectly. As far as I know, they're still married and they're still not talking to me. So <laughs> some mistakes are big, some mistakes are not so big. But then, then there are the other fails, the ones that put all the others in perspective, the really big ones where companies close their doors and people get laid off and relationships get wrecked. Families break up and people get hurt. I bet you made some of those too. I know I have. When you're alone, like maybe driving in your car on a long trip, or at night when you can't sleep, do you ever think about that fail, that failure, and the impact that it had on you and on others? Do you ever wonder, what does God think about that? We've been following this story in Joshua, the book of Joshua, uh, and Israel is finally getting 
its way, finding its way into the promised land. And in Joshua chapter 20, God speaks to Joshua one last time. It's, it's the last time God speaks to Joshua, which makes it a pretty big deal. And it's about what to do about people who make really big, life-altering, life-ending mistakes. It helps answer the question that sometimes keeps you and me up at night. What does God think about my failure? We're going to read all of uh, Joshua chapter 20. It's only nine verses, but it's a really interesting nine verses. Then the Lord said to Joshua, tell the Israelites to designate cities of refuge as I instructed you through Moses so that anyone who kills a person accidentally and unintentionally may flee there and find protection from the avenger of blood. When they flee to one of these cities, they are to stand in the entrance of the city gate and state their case before the elders of that city. Then the elders are to admit the fugitive into their city and provide a place to live among them. If the avenger of blood comes in pursuit, the elders must not surrender the fugitive because the fugitive killed their neighbor unintentionally and without malice aforethought. They are to stay, the fugitive is to stay in that city until they've stood trial before the assembly and until the death of the high priest who is serving at that time. Then they may go back to their own home in the town from which they fled. That's what Lee was talking about just a second ago when he shared with us a communion meditation. So they set apart Kedesh in Galilee in the hill country of Naphtali, Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim, Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron in the hill country of Judah, east of the Jordan on the other side of the Jericho. They designated Bezer in the wilderness on the plateau in the tribe of Reuben, Ramoth in Gilead in the tribe of Gad, and Golan in Bashan in the tribe of Manasseh. You've heard of the Golan Heights, right? Any of the Israelites or any foreigner residing among them who killed someone accidentally could flee to these designated cities and not be killed by the avenger of blood prior to standing trial before the assembly. That avenger of blood line there probably needs some explanation. In ancient societies, all of them, not just Israel, the individualism that we take for granted here in Western culture was just not a thing. People did not think of themselves and identify as individuals. They identified, they thought of themselves as members of a group, a, a tribe, a clan, a family. Um, so if, if a member of your, of your group was injured or killed, it was as if the injury or the death had happened to you personally. There would never have been a Me Too movement in ancient cultures. It was always us. It was always about us. So when somebody from another family or clan or tribe or nation injured or killed somebody from yours, the nearest male relative had the duty, it was a, it was a solemn duty, to restore the balance by either injuring the person who had commi uh, committed the injury or killing them if they'd killed someone. There were no police to call. So justice was administered by the people who had suffered the wrong. Now the problem with that, of course, is that the wounds we suffer always seem greater than the wounds we give. Okay, there's a great takeaway for you right there before we go any further. The wounds that we suffer, and it was that way then and it's this way now, the wounds we suffer always seem so much greater than the wounds that we inflict. And so this culture of retributive justice was always spinning up cycles of violence between groups. Your group would suffer at the hands of another. And so you'd, you'd go and inflict injury to them, but then they would consider your response disproportionate to the original offense, so they'd try to even the score, which would, from your point of view, create another imbalance, and so you'd go try and kind of see where that goes, don't you? Martin Luther King Jr. talked about the ultimate weakness of violence. He says it's, 
The ultimate weakness of violence is that, that it's a descending spiral, begetting the very thing it seeks to destroy. Instead of diminishing evil, it multiplies evil. You've heard the phrase, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. That's from Exodus chapter 21. Believe it or not, that was actually a step toward a more just system. It was God's way of saying, look, if somebody punches you in the mouth, don't go burn down their city. Let the punishment fit the crime. The command to establish cities of refuge was even a step further toward justice. What do you do when somebody accidentally kills someone else? No malice of forethought. It was not a hate crime. It was an accident. Deuteronomy 19, where this, this law first comes up, even includes an example. So you got two guys that are out in the woods. They're chopping wood because winter's coming. It's getting cold. Two guys out there chopping wood, and all of a sudden, the axe head flies off the handle of one of the axes and, and, and hits the other guy in the head and kills him dead. It was an accident. Maybe there was negligence, maybe somebody was being a little reckless, but nobody meant to kill anybody. There was no malice of forethought. It wasn't murder, certainly not first degree murder. So what do you do? Well, if something like that happened, there were six cities in Israel to which a person could go if they'd made a mistake like that, if they, they could flee. They, and these cities were strategically located so that you were never more than a day's journey from any one city. I read one note that said that anywhere in Israel you were less than 32 miles. You're always within 32 miles of a city of refuge. The roads between, this is really cool, the roads between the cities were wider than average roads and they were well maintained. Every year the Levites who lived in the city of refuge would go out and inspect the roads to make sure they were in good shape. Kind of makes you wish we had some Levites here in Huntsville, doesn't it? Kind of inspect the roads. In order to speed up travel time, the high and the low places were smooth to level, and the curves were straightened out, which sounds, I got to tell you, when I read that, I thought, man, that sounds like Isaiah 40. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain hill and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth. That's a prophecy about Jesus. At crossroads, there were signs pointing, uh, pointing toward the city of refuge with the word miklot, the Hebrew word miklot, M-I-K-L-A-T. It means refuge. So if you accidentally killed someone, you could run to a city of refuge and they would take you in. Verse 4 says, the elders are to admit the fugitive into their city and provide a place for them to live. The literal translation of the word admit there is they are to gather him to the city, into the city unto themselves. It's kind of beautiful. Gather, they were to gather them into the city. God wanted for there to be safe places throughout Israel. Places where people who had made life altering, life ending mistakes could go to find mercy and protection and community. Now, you don't have to have a preaching degree to see a correlation there between those cities of refuge and what the church wants to be. Does it seem like a stretch at all to say that the cities of refuge offer a vision for us? A moment ago, we sang this line in one of our songs, we believe he is calling his people to embody his grace today. That's what the church needs to be, isn't it? A place of refuge. Let me give you three characteristics we need to develop if that's what we're going to be. Here's the first one. If the church is going to be a place of refuge for people who are seeking, we need to be a welcoming people. I'm going to spend some time on this one, okay? We need to be a welcoming people. Have you ever been to an event where, where you were invited, somebody invited you to come be a part of it, but once you got there, it felt a lot like a private party? Maybe it was the wedding of a friend of a friend. Why you'd want to go to one of those, I do not know. But you got there and 
everybody knew everybody else and you didn't know anybody. Or maybe it was your spouse's Christmas party and you didn't know anybody but your spouse. Or it was a neighborhood cookout and you're new to the neighborhood. That's how a lot of folks feel when they visit a church, like it's a private party. Everybody they see, if, if you're the visitor, everybody you see is comfortable. They, they laugh at the inside jokes, and they know what all the acronyms are, and they know where the bathrooms are, which is really important. And everybody's being friendly to each other. Deep in, deep in their souls, church people feel like their church is really, really welcoming because they feel welcomed. We feel like our church is really, really welcoming because we feel welcomed. But if you're a guest, if you're visiting and you don't know anybody, not as much as you think. There's a Bible word actually for welcoming people. Shows up over 60 times in the New Testament. The word is greet, G-R-E-E-T. As in Philippians 4.21, greet all God's people in Christ Jesus. The basic meaning of the word greet is to embrace. It can refer to a literal physical embrace or the conceptual idea of acceptance. In the New Testament, it refers to some kind of gesture intended to communicate to the person being greeted, being addressed, that they are accepted, that they are welcome. That greeting, that embracing, that accepting would have been scandalous in first century Roman culture. The church included all kinds of people from, from all kinds of different backgrounds, different ethnic backgrounds and different national backgrounds and different religious backgrounds and different genders and different social strata. Jews and Gentiles, rich and poor, slave and free, just sharing a hug or a handshake, even a verbal acknowledgement of somebody else's presence would have been like ignoring the boundaries, the racial boundaries in Jim Crow America. That's what it would have been like. And so when the Bible talks about greeting, it's not just a convention. It's a big honking deal. And given the state of race relations and political relations in America these days, I would say that the welcome is still a big honking deal. One of the most underrated and underappreciated ministries we have here at Twickenham is the greeting ministry. Those are those folks that stand at the doors and hand you a bulletin and smile and say good morning when you when you walk into the building. Their job is to put a face on the smile of Twickenham, but it's more than that. Their job is to send a message to people when they walk in this building. And the message is, we're glad you're here. We want you here. You are welcome here. You are accepted. Being a welcoming people is our way of widening the roads and raising the valleys and lowering the mountains and straightening out the curves and making it easier, people, easier for people to find refuge that they're looking for. And, and i got to tell you, it's not just a job of the official greeters. Now, you've got to have those, okay? And if you're interested in that, Doris Elkins is your girl. Talk to her. She'll hook you up with, with being a greeter. If you're, if you're not a really friendly person, though, we got another job for you, okay? That may not be your thing, okay? But if you're kind of gregarious, all right, if you're sensitive to people's emotions, that would be, that'd be a great ministry for you. But, but it's not just the job of the greeters. It's, it's, it's got to be everybody's job. It's your job every Sunday. If you're a member here, you're the host not the guest. And you know what that means, right? The host is the person who gets there early and welcomes the guests when they come in. If you're a member, you're the host. And i got to add this. I'm going to preach for a minute here, okay? If you're not here, 
you can't welcome those who are. The minimum basic requirement for being a welcoming people is being here to welcome. Now, uh, when I take my glasses off and step out, elders get nervous, okay? So I'm going to make you guys nervous for a minute. I understand that there are times you can't be here, and I know that right now we've got people who are watching this service online. Hello, Mom. Which camera are we on? Hi, Mom. My mom watches this service online every Sunday. There are times when you can't be here. Health reasons. A lot of us struggle with it. Some of us are home all the time, and this is our connection, this, the, the virtual connection, the video connection. We can't be here on a Sunday. I'm not talking to you. Okay, if your kid's sick and you're home with your kid, I'm not talking to you. If you're, if you're sick, you got a health problem, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the rest of us. If we're not here, we can't welcome. One of the big things that's uh, one of the hot conversation pieces right now in evangelical circles, and it's not just evangelicals, it's everybody, All, a lot of church leaders are talking about attendance because it's way down across the board. In all churches, attendance is down statistically. And there's a lot of concern about that. And I understand it. I understand that concern. I know that's not the only way to gauge how we're doing, but it is important. It does matter. Hebrews chapter 10 talks about, hey, don't forsake meeting together. That's a bad thing, bad habit to get into. So I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you. If you're going to, if you're going to go to a game on Saturday night somewhere, awesome. Go to the game. It's worth the effort to get back here for church on Sunday so you can welcome. And I, you know, I hear people, people tell me all the time, I get a lot more just watching the service online. I can get a lot more out of it if I watch it online than I can if I'm actually there. I'm not even going to argue that with you. I don't believe that. I'm not going to argue it with you, but I'm going to concede that for the sake of the argument. Fine. You get a lot out of it by not being there. Great. But you don't give anything. If you're not here on a Sunday, you can't give anything. You can't give a hug. You can't give a handshake. You can't give somebody a shoulder to cry on. You can't give encouragement. You can't give a kind word. You can't give your presence. And that's what we're looking for here. Church is not a place you go. It's a people you belong to. It's a family you belong to. And if we're not here on a Sunday, we can't give of ourselves to others. Maybe we can get a lot out of it virtually, but you can't give anything. In order to be a welcoming people, we got to be here. Luke chapter 11, Jesus had some criticism for the Pharisees. He said, you guys love respectful greetings in the marketplace. And they did. They enjoyed being, being recognized and respected and greeted and accepted, but they were not very accepting. That's one of the big differences between Pharisees and disciples. Pharisees love to be welcomed. Disciples love to to welcome. If we're going to be a refuge church, we got to be a welcoming people. Second, we got to be a merciful people. If we're going to be a refuge church, we got a merciful people. Joshua 20, 4 and 5, God says to Israel, admit the fugitive into your city. Provide a place for them to live among you. If the avenger of blood comes in pursuit, do not surrender the fugitive. Here's the thing. A welcome makes people feel wanted. Mercy makes people feel safe. Mercy has got two sides to it. First, it's about what we don't do. We don't hold somebody's past against them. You're looking for a church, and you're here today, and you're thinking, maybe this could be my church, but man, if they knew about what I'd done, can I tell you, we do not hold your past against you. The past stays there. We don't let somebody's history determine their future. We don't define somebody by their worst decision. Wouldn't you hate to be defined by your worst decision? Mercy doesn't do that. Grace, grace means you get what you don't deserve. Mercy means you don't get what you do deserve. There's an old story about a woman who approached the Emperor Napoleon with a, with a request for pardon. Her son had committed some crime and she was asking Napoleon for pardon and he said, well, what did he do? And she told him what he did and, and, and then Napoleon said, well, ma'am, if he did that, he doesn't deserve mercy. And she said, sir, if he deserved it, it wouldn't be mercy. 
So Napoleon granted her request. Mercy is about what we don't do, but it's also about what we do. There's a Christian minister named Tony Campolo years ago was drinking coffee in a grimy little cafe in Honolulu, Hawaii at 3.30 in the morning. A group of prostitutes walked in and crowded around him at the bar, and one of them, a woman named Agnes, started lamenting loudly, drunkenly, that the next day was her birthday and that in her entire life, no one had ever thrown her a party. Well, Campolo just listened and drank his coffee, and the women eventually left. And so he asked the owner of the cafe, a guy named Harry, about the women. And Harry said, yeah, they come in here every morning, about 3.15, 3.30. And so the next morning, Campolo shared with Harry this idea, the next morning at 3.15, that cafe was packed with a very rough-looking crowd, and Harry and his wife and that minister, Tony Campolo. And when Agnes walked in, she saw the crowd, and she saw streamers and balloons and Harry holding a birthday cake and everybody screaming and singing, happy birthday. She was overwhelmed. Tears poured down her face as the people sang to her. Probably not many churches that would They would do something like that. But that's exactly what a refuge church would do. We have to be a welcoming people. And we have to be a mercy-giving people. And then we have to be a truth-telling people. The welcome makes people feel wanted. Mercy makes people feel safe. And telling the truth makes people feel loved. And that truth-telling is a two-way street. When a fugitive ran to a city of refuge, they had to stop at the gate, and they had to state their case. They had to tell the truth about what they had done, which I suspect we think sounds kind of harsh. I mean, requiring somebody to confess the worst thing they've done. But if if you've done it, if you've confessed, you know that confession isn't a burden. It's how the burden is lifted. Confession is not a punishment. It's a passage to freedom. We can never be free of the past until we tell the truth about it. If we do not tell the truth, then we never really know whether we are loved. You see, if I only show you a fabricated image of me, a facsimile, a fiction, then I never know if you love the real me or not. Maybe you just love the fiction that I've told you. Maybe you just love the story. Maybe you love the virtual me, not the real me, if I never tell you the truth. And so I live with this fear that one day the truth will come out, and when it does, you'll realize that I'm not who you thought I was, and you won't love me. And the welcome with which I was received And the mercy that I was shown, well, those would have been built on a shaky foundation of a fictional past. So I've got to tell you the truth. You've got to tell me the truth. But it's not just the refugee that has to tell the truth. The refuge church has to be committed to truth as well. And this is where it gets really hard. Because we've got to be tender with sinners. That's the welcome. That's the mercy. But the the refuge church must never be soft on sin because sin is what makes refugees out of us all to begin with. And we struggle with this side of the equation, I think. There was a time in our tribe, in, in the churches of Christ, when all we wanted to do was tell you the truth and we were pretty certain we knew it and you didn't. So we were gonna be the truth tellers and now we're a little embarrassed by that. We don't want to be that way. And so we're a little reluctant to tell the truth sometimes. The danger is that if we fail to speak the truth, we fail to love people. Because if you love somebody, you tell them the truth. That story about Tony Campolo offers a useful perspective here. The welcome and the mercy that he showed Agnes gave him credibility to tell her the truth about her lifestyle. Would it have been loving 
if he'd just thrown a big party for Agnes and, let, let her, and then let her go on with that self-destructive lifestyle, that wouldn't have been loving. That would have been enabling. The welcome and the mercy give us the credibility to say to somebody, there is a better way. But you got to do a lot of welcoming and you got to show a lot of mercy before you get to say that. We're, as a church, reading through the Bible. Um, and I, I think uh, we're not, in, in our effort to read through Scripture, we're not quite to the book of Jeremiah yet. But Jeremiah has some pretty tough language for Israel's spiritual leaders in Jeremiah chapter 6. He says, prophets and priests alike all practice deceit. They're not telling the truth. They dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. They put band-aids on bullet wounds. Something is really, really wrong, and my, the priests, the spiritual leaders, are not telling the people the truth about it. They say, peace, peace, when there is no peace. And then in our read-through-the-Bible effort, we are in the middle of Isaiah. He had something to say about this too in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who puts bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. If I don't tell you the truth about me, I never really know whether you love me or just the version of me. But if you never tell me the truth I need to hear, then I know you don't love me. Because love tells the truth. Welcome, mercy, truth. That's what refugees in ancient Israel found when they ran to one of those six cities. That's what people need to find when they come to Twickenham. And those three gifts are gifts we can give because that's what God has given us through Jesus. Lee mentioned this, one of the curious features of those ancient cities of, ref of refuge. If you fled to one of them, you had to stay there until the high priest died. His death was kind of like a statute of limitations on whatever crime you committed. Nobody that I've read or talked to has a good explanation for that, but it did remind me of this. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who is tempted in every way, just as we are, but he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that, me may, so that we may receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. That's Hebrews 4, 14, 15, and 16. We don't have to wait for our high priest to die. He already did. And in dying, he took the penalty for all our sins. That's the truth. That's the mercy. And that's the welcome. That's who he is, and that's who he calls us to be. Let's stand. I want you to pray with me, please, as we ask God to bless us with this. You come before you this morning as people who have made little mistakes and big ones. And some of the things that we've done are not really, we can't really classify as mistakes. They're sin. They are violations of your truth. They are acts of rebellion against you. They are behaviors that were motivated by hate or by envy or greed. They come from some really bad places. And so we ask you to forgive us for minimizing what those sins are and where they come from, and the effects that they had. Because not only did they hurt us and the people that we love, or who loved us, they damaged our relationship with you. And some of us are still living in that damage. And so I pray this morning that we will be a people who will embrace the truth of that, and that we will find mercy and that once we found mercy, we'll do everything we can as individuals and as a church 
to lower the mountains and raise the valleys, to straighten out the curves and smooth the roads so that other people can be welcomed to find mercy and hear that truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Merciful God and Father, loving us like no other, hear our prayer, the cry of our hearts as we come to want to say again how much we appreciate your being here and remember when you come back next time you'll be welcomed we'll be glad to see you and you'll be accepted have a great week let's pray um, this is a well-known prayer that was uh, written in the 12th century um, this is one of my favorite prayers and it's called the uh, saint francis prayer uh, so if you'd all uh, bow with me Lord, make me an instrument of your peace, that where there is hatred, I may bring love, that where there is wrong, I may bring the spirit of forgiveness, that where there is discord, I may bring harmony, that where there is error, I may bring truth, that where there is doubt, I may bring faith, that where there is despair, I may bring hope, that where there are shadows, I may bring light. That where there is sadness, I may bring joy. Lord, grant that I may seek rather to comfort than to be comforted, to understand than to be understood, to love than to be loved. For it is by self-forgetting that one finds. It is by forgiving that one is forgiven. It is by dying that one awakens to eternal life. Amen.